Okay, recording in progress. Thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Nassini. Um, I have always wanted to do the lecture series and I have finally the chance to do it. So um, without much, much more ado, let's get into it. Um, so an introduction to follow that introduction. Um, <laughs> Um, all of my work is through uh, lead seals, essentially. I do work on other material culture types, but lead seals are my passion. Um, they are one of the few artifacts that function as documents as well. So they're incredibly diagnostic and they give you lots of meaty information on the past. Uh, lead seals uh, are generally one to three centimeters in diameter. Uh, they are metallic lead, so lead in its, its solid state. Um, they're used to, they've been used for forever to mark goods. Um, they were used by uh, Greeks and Romans on amphora. Um, in the Middle Ages, they started to be used on textiles and that's a tradition that has continued uh, until the late 19th century um, when they kind of fell out of fashion. Nowadays, we just use clothing tags and uh, lead seals are sort of relegated to uh, uh, sealing cargo and providing a tamper evidence seal. So lead seals, when we talk about them, they were created and attached to goods in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, there's maybe some evidence of their use in North America, but it's a little tenuous, uh, except with the Russian American company over on the, the West Coast. They were definitely using them on seal furs. So when, when we look at them, they're, they're really unique in that they come from Europe, but we find them in North America and they preserve well, whereas the textiles they marked do not preserve very well. So they're sort of the sole, the sole testament to uh, textiles in the archeological record in many ways. Uh, the marks on them often reference people uh, locations, goods. They can have very specific information such as the quality of the certain type of good they're marking. So like the quality of the textile, the length of the textile. Uh, in my case, I look almost uniquely at lead cloth seals um, because I am interested in the textile trade and how textiles were used at different sites. I'm actually currently working uh, with Jamestown Rediscovery on a collection of over 300 lead seals, uh, where I'm looking to see what the early colonists from 1607 to 1620 were doing with textiles in their world. And I'm starting to try to understand the links with England in the supply chains. But my passion, what got me into lead seals, of course, is French colonial archaeology. And the French colonial seals are something um, that over, over the years, looking at multiple sites, I've gotten this, this deep understanding of. And um, sort of every time one surfaces and I recognize it, it's kind of like an old friend. I'm like, oh, I know you. Um, so it's, it's, it's really great to be able to share that with you guys tonight. So I'm going to focus on some of my favorites, actually, uh, seals of the Mariette family. So the seal right here uh, is from the site of Fort St. Joseph. Uh, the full inscription on it, you can see I've completed with brackets, it would be Mariette Negociant à Montauban. So um, Mariette uh, Negociant is sort of a merchant. Uh, it's, a, it's not a local merchant, it's an international merchant. If you can think of it that way, Negociant, it's um, a more important uh, mover of goods across long distances. It's not your, your merchant that's at work in the marketplace. Uh, so these, these people are, are working in Montauban, France to transport goods all the way to Fort St. Joseph. Um, so they work as dynasties, these merchant families in Montauban. So uh, it goes generally within the male lines in the family. So brothers will be in it together, uh, fathers and uncles, uh, fathers and sons. There's different combinations of people that are at work at any given time uh, within these merchant dynasties, but generally they're male. So if you're wondering where Montauban is, which you probably are, uh, here's a, a map of France to help you out. The gold star is Paris. So if you can find Paris on a map, you can kind of navigate your way around France, uh, the, the pentagram. So uh, if you look, I've circled Montauban in red. It's, at the, it's on the Canal de Garonne, which is a completion of the Canal du Midi. These are big canal projects that were undertaken in the time of Louis XIV by Philippe d'Orléans, his brother. Uh, he was in charge of these and they really sort of opened up trade uh, throughout Southern France and, and allowed for transport from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. Um, so it kind of works, it was, it was revolutionary sort of like the Panama Canal was when it was built. It really linked these two major bodies of water together and allowed for goods and people to transit along, uh, along that 
canal uh, swiftly. So because Montauban is on the Tarn River, which leads into the Garonne, it had access to the waterways that went out to Bordeaux, to La Rochelle, and to Rochefort. Um, La, La Rochelle is, is the port that you'll hear the most when you talk about imports to New France. Uh, it's, it's mentioned as like the place that everything comes from, but it's kind of important to note that military shipments to colonies that were supposed to supply troops or to supply trade with natives for alliances uh, left out of Rochefort. They were procured by a government official who then sent it to New France uh, for somebody else there to handle and distribute. Uh, La Rochelle, uh, was a little bit more, you know, your merchants working outside for, for the colonists of, uh, of New France that had um, procure, uh, procurators in the colonies uh, working for them to distribute their goods. And the pattern of shipping changed over time, whereas La Rochelle, well, St. Malo was very important in the beginning, and then you kind of move on to La Rochelle being the most important. And then as you go on, Bordeaux sort of increases in importance as well. And I actually have seen bale seals from Bordeaux. So bale seals is in they marked uh, or were put on large bales of textiles coming from Europe. We're talking about the ones you had to lower into a ship by crane um, that had several packets on the inside. Um, so not, not what you're putting in a canoe, much larger. Um, so I have seen those at sites uh, from Montreal East. Um, once you get past Montreal, you know, a lot of that trade is going on in canoes. They have packed certain assortments to go to different port, uh, different posts. So it's, it's not the same use. Um, and so what you find west of Montreal is mostly cloth seals from the individual textile pieces. So here's sort of a window into um, commerce in Montauban. Uh, you have one great big road in Ville Bourbon, which is on the opposite side of the Tarn River from uh, the majority of Montauban, uh, that was medieval Montauban is on one side, and then the newer stuff is in Ville Bourbon, well, newer as in 17th, 18th century. Uh, so in Ville Bourbon, uh, you have records from the 1750s and 1740s of, uh, you know, goings on with textiles because it was such a huge, uh, part of life in, uh, in Montauban um, was the Canada trade, as they called it. So the fur trade, when you get over to Europe, is known as the Canada trade, right? So it's the same thing. Don't let me confuse you with that. But uh, we have all these records of woolen cloth being hung up to dry because they were doing dyeing and finishing in these houses along the Grand Rue de Ville uh, You had textiles hung up to dry across the street that were hanging so low and there were so many textiles hanging that it stopped traffic and caused traffic issues. So you have the authorities specifically asking merchants and asking people who live on that street to hang their cloth no more, uh, no, no less than 10 feet above ground. So it has to be up where it won't get in the way of traffic because there's just such a massive amount of textiles being produced. In fact, um, in 1725, there are actually 4,500 pieces of kedzi specifically, just one type of woolen cloth made at Montauban that year. Um, so we're talk talking about that's a piece is, is textiles that comes off of the loom. So think of sort of our equivalent of a bolt now. Um, these pieces, there's 4,500 in a year of just one variety. And that's the most popular variety produced in Montauban, which is a kedzi, uh, C-A-D-I-S. Um, kedzi is a worsted. Uh, that has um, sort of a nap put on it, like a fuzz, like on a like on a woolen blanket, the kind of scratchy stuff. And that is actually very water repellent. So kedzi was a favorite of sailors and people that worked outdoors. So it was really, it appealed to almost everybody. So it was very popular and it was obviously popular for the Canada trade because of the quality of it. So Montauban had this trade in textiles since the medieval period. And it went on and it sort of petered out after the fall of Canada because they lost their main market. They lost the Canada trade. Um, we kind of put them in a rough spot. And then in 1763, there was a flood that took out a lot of, a lot of um, the, the merchant houses along the Tarn, you know, it kind of incapacitated them, uh, kind of stopped the town for a while. So uh, between natural disaster and the loss of the Canadian market, you can really see the influence of what was going on here in the lives of people in Montauban. 
So here's a look at uh, some of the houses, these merchants houses um, along the Tarn River in Montauban. So the one that I have circled in black there is the, the Hotel Mariette Oriel. Um, uh, hotel, in this case, it's referring to what, what the Montaubanais call an hotel particulier. So it's a, a building with like a very special purpose. So in this case, that purpose is textile production. And you can see um, on the back side, which I have pictured there, these there's like windows and doors coming out from that very bottom level. Those would have come right out onto the riverbank. So there was uh, dyeing uh, being done inside the basement of that house. And then you would have had other, um, other work being done on the floors above and also the merchant residing at that place to kind of survey what was going on. So this was his in-town house, right? They also had country houses. Um, the merchant would have also owned some fulling mills, which is where you're gonna go to, um, to really uh, make sure that the weave of your cloth binds together. It's what, it was, it's what makes woolens more compact than like linens, for example, where you can kind of separate the threads. Woolens are just a big pile of fluff, essentially, in that that fulling process is what brings that sh that sheep's wool to, to that specific texture and kind of locks it all together. So fulling mills would have been very important. Um, you can see with the vaults there, it was probably for storage and for dyeing. So they would have had vats of dye going on down there. They could have washed the dye as needed in the river. Um, so it's that waterway is really important in the creation of textiles, um, as important as the architecture is. This is the opposite side of that little yellow house from the previous slide, by the way. So that yellow house is the Mariette house from the street, from the Grand Rue de, the Grand Rue de Ville Bourbon. And here it is from the water. So it's just a little strip right there, right along the water on the canal. So you can kind of see these are some examples of architecture from uh, Canada Merchant Houses in Montauban. Uh, if you go into the records, what's interesting is while I was digging through archives in Montauban, I came across a reference to one of these merchants and their the description for them, whereas everybody else had, you know, bricklayer, artisan, whatever. The description for this person was specifically um, merchant uh, it was Negociant Canadien, which is Canadian negotiate, right? So it's, they're identifying themselves essentially as Canadians in an interesting way. They really, being part of the Canada trade is a really deep seated part of their identity. And they're sending family members over there. So there's this sort of sense of like a united Atlantic identity with these people, even though they're in the middle of France, they're identifying themselves strongly with the Canada trade. And you can see how much money they were making off of the Canada trade here in these houses. Uh, the two on the on the left um, are examples from the Marriott Oriel house. So you have a monogrammed uh, uh, a wrought iron cast iron fence on the back of the uh, the back of the building that has their initials in it, uh, Marguerite and Oriel. You have a an iron staircase leading up. There are like marble floors and columns in that house. So you can see that. There's a lot of money if that's just their in-town house. That's not even the nice country house, right? And the, the lions and the crest on the other side um, is actually in the medieval part of Montauban, the main part of Montauban. And that's the original uh, house for the uh, Violette Dagnon family. Uh, we find seals for the Violette Dagnon in, uh, at Michel Mackinac, in fact, I, I found some. So they're the ones where if you go to Montauban and ask about the woolens that were produced there, everybody will mention the Violette Dagnon because they were the first uh, to introduce the creation of Kedzi, that specific type of cloth that made Montauban so popular. Another interesting thing about Montauban and the people that live there is that in a Catholic kingdom, they were heavily Protestant in this area. La Rochelle was also heavily Protestant. Um, they were actually uh, pitted against the Catholic government during wars, wars of religion in the 17th century. And there are still traces of this on the landscape in Montauban. So you can see on the Église Saint-Jacques de Montauban here, I have um, pointed arrows at some of the artillery damage from the siege in 1621 that took place there when Louis, Louis XIII attempted to take the city. He failed and had to raise the siege. Um, he did not get into Montauban until it surrendered uh, eight years later after La Rochelle was defeated. 
Um, so there's this strong Protestant identity and there was some tolerance for Protestants, but uh, in the 1730s and 40s, there was this, this time where they kind of cracked down on, on Protestantism in France. And a lot of the Protestant ministers and practitioners sort of went underground. So we have some records from that time. It's called the, the Eau des Arts, is what it's called. So you have these records from the Des Arts when um, there's, uh, there's notes on people getting married, people being baptized within the Protestant church, these records that were kept sort of underground and were only released later after Protestantism was reaccepted. Um, interestingly enough, these families sent family members who were Protestant to Canada, even though Canada as it was established was supposed to be a colony only for Catholics, there were Protestants in the colony for sure. Um, these merchants though, the Mariettes and their families were, weren't were uh, really allowed to settle. They were um, sort of uh, marchand foreign. So they weren't, they weren't part of the population. They couldn't intermarry with Canadians. They were supposed to be there for business only. Um, how much of that actually went on, um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but even today, uh, when I went to, uh, to Montauban in 2018, 2019, um, I was asking around, I was asking about the architecture and everything. And there's this very large white stone cathedral in the middle of the town that is the Catholic church, you know, in town. And every other structure in the town is this like pink brick, right? Uh, it's, it's a local brick made from the clay there. It's, it's, a, it's a very brilliant pink color when it's fired. It's actually the same as in Toulouse. Toulouse is known as the pink city. You go there, La Ville Rose because of the color of the bricks used in all the buildings. So it's a stark contrast, contrast you have between the pink buildings that are local in this white Catholic church that was put there by the government after the defeat of the Protestants. So a lot of, a lot of people that live there still remark on it. So I mentioned it to somebody that I was staying with and they said, oh yeah, they came and put that church in our town. You can tell it's not from here. So there's this sense of Protestant pride still that's there and this Protestant identity that continues till today. So when we're talking about um, merchant operations and the, uh, the dynasties uh, of merchants in Montauban, uh, it was important to, um, to intermarry between families in the town. Um, a lot of these families were all Protestant, so they kind of went to the same churches, they knew each other through social circles. So intermarriage was, was actually kind of a smart idea as it was, but intermarriage allowed um, partnerships to be created. So I have a couple of designs from seals here that I've, I've traced. You can see the top one is Mariette, well, Daniel D, D Mariette, Lene et Dumas. So the elder Mariette, um, and Dumas. Dumas is a different family. Um, they're, they're a different merchant family in Montauban that entered this partnership with the Mariettes um, through marriage. So sort of anytime you see a combination of merchants, you have to look back and you'll eventually find an intermarriage between those families that allowed that business to prosper. Um, likewise, the, the lower mark there is the Roli Frères, so um, the Roli brothers. Um, they, that family, intermarried with the Mariettes as well. We have records of that. So these, these three families, at the very least, are all connected. And there's more in the town that are connected through marriage. So it's interesting to think when you see these, these business partnerships, there's always a woman behind it. You think of women having no power, but when intermarriage occurs, they're in charge of partially of raising the children a large amount of the time. So they're sort of forming that next generation of merchants that takes on the dynasty. So you, you can't really discount women in this, in this man's world of, of, of commerce. You have to remember that they're there, even if they don't immediately appear. And these marriage alliances also, you know, roped in cousins, roped in uncles, roped in far-flung family members that you could send then to Quebec. And if they were younger, they were often sent to Quebec for training. They would work as a clerk in Quebec and they would send back news on what was going on there, what was desirable, what was needed for the markets back to their family in Europe. So it was a way of, of having an inside agent, someone to communicate with um, and, and to, to help plan what you need to send in the next shipment. 
So it was a really important job, but it was also a way of introducing uh, younger people or people from other families into the trade who are interested in joining. When we talk about women as well, when we talk about textile production, we think maybe mostly men doing the dyeing and, and the weaving and everything, but that was sort of mixed, men and women. But one thing that was very, very gendered still was um, spinning. So women have been involved in textile production for forever. You have um, women wearing string skirts that are found in Bronze Age burials in Denmark, right? You have the, the whole idea of the string revolution, how women came up with string and it allowed all textiles that thenceforth to be made, you know? Um, in, the, in the case of, you know, the 17th and 18th century, the importance of women in textile production hadn't necessarily gone away because they were still spinning and spinning and spinning. It was something that they could do that was productive, that made money, um, and that was portable. So you can watch a children while you can watch children while you spin with a drop spindle. You can watch sheep while you spin with a drop spindle. You can walk through the market with the drop spindle spinning. And it's once you get skilled at it, it's a muscle memory. So you can just do it sort of without thinking so you can engage in other tasks, but you make money doing it because you're contracted to provide yarn to a merchant or to weavers, right? So you have to think of the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of yards of yarn and fiber that were spun by these women as sort of the basis for this, te uh, for this, this the textile industry, because without that, you can't make pieces of cloth. You can't make you know, blankets, you can't make clothing. So at the very base of all this productivity are everyday women in the country or in town that are spinning every spare inch of their day. As the 18th century goes on, you see this role kind of kind of dissipate. You see less drop spindles, you see more spinning wheels, you see more control over spinning in the textile industry as merchants start to take an interest um, uh, on, they take interest in the smaller details of textile production. They really wanna micromanage everything. Um, you know, machines start to come out. So you see a change in how things are done, but um, it's just something I've been working with recently is, you know, how do people that you don't necessarily see at first fit into the story. So this is a good example of that. So talking about factories and um, larger sort of industrialization of textile industry, um, the uh, royal manufacturers, so sort of this giant uh, factory with a royal permit to produce uh, dra, which is um, thick woolen broadcloths, um, exists in Carcassonne. And luckily we have a couple seals from Fort St. Joseph that come from Carcassonne and that specified connection to woolen cloth. So here um, is the, the factory that most of this is being produced um, at in Carcassonne. Uh, it's on the water, just like the ones uh, in, uh, in Montauban. It's nearby water so that you can die, so that you can fall, so that you can do what you need to do. Um, What's interesting, I think, is when I visited, uh, you could see where it was once the manufacture of Royale, but the Royale had been chiseled out during the French Revolution. So um, you kind of have a trace of the revolution there where that black arrow is. Um, but, you know, it's very ornate, which kind of reflects um, the importance of this industry in Carcassonne. And in this, this dra that was being produced there was really popular with Native Americans around Fort St. Joseph. So you can see um, how the demand here was sort of driving the production in France. So as I said earlier, goods really moved by waterways. So you had a lot of what was produced in Montauban going up towards um, La Rochelle and Rochefort. Um, here, there's, there's always uh, partners in other places, right? So you don't have to travel all over France. If you can just write your partner in Bordeaux and say, hey, there's a shipment coming. Can you please send it to such and such in Quebec, right? So um, the Mariettes had a connection with the Gadi family who were actually Jewish, which is interesting to see different religions at play um, in this. Um, and uh, the Gadi would then send it to Canada or they would send it to a military contractor 
in Rochefort that they had um, they had ties to. So they, they could send it to multiple places and multiple people in order to get it to Canada. And in New France, um, they would have other merchants uh, acting for them. So the Mariettes had representatives in France, uh, mostly for the period that we're interested in. Uh, their, their, their procurators are Taché and Gautier. So they were based in Quebec City and they had houses in Quebec City and they were there to receive the goods and to sign off on them and to sign legal papers in the name of the Marriott family. So um, they essentially did everything legally that the Marriott's would need to do if they were there in person. Um, and then of course, there were the clerks that I mentioned that were working in the storehouses in Quebec that were shirt tail relations that were able to get into the trade that way. Um, it's, it's interesting to look at engravings in the time of Negociant. Um, on the left, we have uh, an engraving of a Negociant in his study uh, working with all the documents. So he's got all this, all these, uh, these papers on his table. He's got uh, correspondence from other merchants in France, he's got correspondence from his partners. He's got reports on what's popular. Um, and then above him in the background, you can just barely see it. There's actually a globe sitting above all of those books. So you really, you kind of have to peek at it. It's in the dark, it's kind of tucked away there, but it's sort of like a, a little artist wink at how implicated these merchants were in global goings on, how they had to think about everything going on in the world, how they had to know literally what the price of tea in China was, you know? Um, they had to be au courant of all of these things in order to be successful. Um, you also have uh, on the right side, the Protestant church in La Rochelle. So you can see how important Protestantism was in La Rochelle and how religious connections and religious identity may have form those partnerships over time um, that enabled the importation of textiles to New France. I really, I really love Vernet's port scenes because you can see in, in France all the things that we find on sites in North America that are related to the fur trade. So this right here is Rochefort and um, a lot of things that were bound for Canada for trade with Native Americans did come through Rochefort, even though it was technically military, you know, ma maintenance of alliances is a military function in New France. So you can see on the left there, you have a man st stacking different size chaudières, the big copper pots um, for trades, probably for trade. Um, you have some iron pots there too. You can see one's overturned with the uh, the feet sticking out. So all these things are bound for the colonies. This is specifically a view of Rochefort taken from the storehouse for the colonies. So these are all things bound for colonial consumption. You can also see on the right hand side, um, there are some bales of textiles being opened. You see how large the bales are and kind of how they're put together um, and how they have a linen covering on them. You can see people taking the blankets out to look at them and inspect them before they get sewn back in and put on the ship. So, and, and that's just a fragment of the area where they have the textiles spread out. There's, there's quite a few bales in this whole view. Um, so it's, and you can also see kind of some of the rigs they would use to lift things onto the ships. Um, but, you know, you get a real sense of what's getting on the ships to be sent over finally. And then, of course, when they arrive in the New World, they arrive in Quebec. Um, and Quebec is right on the water. And a lot of the houses that are now quite a ways from the shore because of, uh, because of fill in the harbor that was put in the 19th century, they're very, very far away from the river. Back in the 18th and 17th century, they would have been right on the water. So you could pull little ships up or you could pull the ships up and then have little landing boats come ashore with goods and that they would go right up the stairs onto the dock into the cellar and they'd be there um, for further transportation westward. Um, a lot of the really beautiful restored buildings you see in Quebec um, have these vaulted, vaulted rooms in the basement which kind of harken back back to the vaulted rooms that are in the basement of the merchants' houses in Montauban, right? That area for storage and for all purpose use. Um, a lot of them now <laughs> are used as bars. Uh, so uh, if you ever really want some good French onion soup, go and find out where all the textiles used to be stored because it'll probably be there. Um, 
the, and from Quebec, of course, they're going to come westward, either through Montreal or through merchant in Quebec that are hiring engage, that are hiring canoe men to take these things west. So looking at where things end up, this is a distribution of all the seals of the Marriott family that I'm aware of at this time. Um, so I kind of wanted to see how far reaching they are because I know they show up in many, many, many different places. Um, so to see it all, to see it all spread out, you can see it's Charleston, South Carolina. There's one reported, which is you you wouldn't think of that immediately. Or you know, Louisbourg in Nova Scotia makes sense because Louisbourg was sort of the first stop into New France. Um, but there's there's some that are kind of far flung. Um, and it's interesting to see how much business they were doing and where, where all of their goods ended up. You know, they had this huge range of influence on what people were using. People were using their textiles in all of these different places. Um, so, so you can really see uh, how interconnected everything is. All these different sites are all connected back to the Mariette family. And all the people on those sites are using that textile in different ways. Um, the, the seal in Charleston is actually really interesting because Charleston is a very active Protestant area. So you have to wonder if the French Protestants that are settling in South Carolina are wanting goods from home or goods that they're familiar with or goods from Protestants specifically to make a statement because a lot of the people there fled religious persecution to South Carolina. So it's, it's, it's interesting that there are these different trends in consumption um, all over the place. So if we circle back to Fort St. Joseph, um, you know, we're, we're finding the seals here. That, that seal on the screen right now um, is a seal of the Marriott family that is from Fort St. Joseph. And you can see there's five men in a canoe, right? At least that's how it's been interpreted for a long time because there are five men in a canoe. But if you look fairly closely at it, it starts to look less canoe-like when you take the context that it came from. You know, there's kind of these these higher edges to the boat than you would see maybe in a canoe, and those men are sitting and paddling this way, sort of like a rowboat. So, I've started to interpret these instead as canal boats from the Tarn, um, that river behind all the merchants' houses in Montauban. Um, so, a voyageur here in New France, when they looked at the seal that they had brought all this way from Quebec and Montreal to give to somebody on the site. Were they seeing a canoe or were they seeing a rowboat? You know, did they did they understand what was going on in Montauban? Did they did they have connections with people there? Um, these are the sort of questions you can start to ask about shared identities and understandings that might have shaped the way things played out on the ground here in New France. Um, every object that's on Earth here is a reminder that Fort Saint Joseph is part of something much bigger. It's, it doesn't exist in a vacuum, even though it's on the edge of empire way out in the middle of nowhere that people, you know, all the, the military people dread of being stationed here because it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's really not, it's still connected to everything. You can still, you know, place an order for something at Fort St. Joseph and someone way over in Europe should in theory hear about it and be able to, to fulfill that need. So, it, it kind of brings a new importance and a richness to everything going on here at Fort St. Joseph um, when you look beyond the post. Thank you. Great, well, thank, thank you, Catherine, for that coverage of just that one seal. I, I know you've, uh, you've looked at scores of seals just from Fort St. Joseph and and each one obviously tells a very, very rich story. Uh, let's see if we have some questions either in the chat or maybe from, uh, from our audience members. Um, if you'd like to enter your question into the chat, we'd be happy to address those to, to Catherine. Uh, while people are, um, are entering their questions in, Catherine, let me ask you, you mentioned, uh, wool uh, among the, the types of cloth being made at uh, Montalban. Uh, what other types of um, fabrics were produced either there or some of the other important textile centers in France that found their way to Fort St. Joseph? 
Um, in terms of things uh, landing at Fort St. Joseph, the, ma the majority of the seals at Fort St. Joseph are related to wool manufacturing areas. Um, you could kind of you can kind of tell, uh, depending on what area you run in the geography of that area sometimes, what it's going to produce. And when you get into the area that you have uh, Montauban and Toulouse and Carcassonne, they're producing a lot of woolens because just north of them, you know, or, or east of them as it may be, is the city of Mazme, which is just sheep country. There's far more sheep there than people at that time because it has a higher altitude which means the sheep grow better fleece. Um, so you're able to use that um, in woolen productions and you can easily transport that to nearby towns, which are then doing the producing. Um, so other places this shows up is if you go um, into the very north of France, there's a lot of wool production um, around the Amiens, uh, sort of some of the World War I areas there, there's a lot of woolen production because of uh, the, uh, the environment and what it does to sheep that are raised there, um, which is, is also something that's noted uh, by people who come to New France, they're like, oh, it's very mountainous in some places here. It'd be really good to set up sheep, but nobody ever really did. There was never any huge manufacturing centers of textiles in New France until the English period. And even then there weren't very many. Um, so other things that were coming out of France in general though, um, that you don't necessarily see at Fort St. Joseph is uh, silks. So if you're looking at uh, the area around Marseille, for example, the town of Nîmes, uh, Nîmes is producing a ton of silk, silk stockings, um, you know, sort of knitted silk things, but also woven silks. Uh, Lyon is producing a lot of very intricate silk work, uh, sort of the stuff that you would also expect to find maybe in Spitalfields in England, which is what, French Huguenot know, refugees. Um, Spittlefield silk, which is so highly renowned for its its detail and its quality, is once again from French producers, essentially. Um, so you see some silks coming out. Um, you have some trade potentially in cottons, uh, printed cottons, plain cottons. Printed cottons are technically outlawed in France, um, so they'd be getting in through illicit trade channels uh, with the Dutch or the English. Uh, who didn't have the same measures in place, uh, or the plain cottons you would probably see coming through uh, the Compagnie des Indes, the, the, the India company for, uh, for France uh, would be importing certain things. They were also importing uh, écarlatin, which is a type of dra, uh, dra uh, heavy broadcloth made of wool that was made in Carcassonne. They were importing that into New France in order to compete with English wool producers. Um, that were putting their wool into the Native American market and dredging up competition. Great. So I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and I know a lot of that information uh, is included in, uh, in your chapter in uh, the Fort St. Joseph Revealed book as well. So, yeah, great. certainly. Yeah. So let me ask you, there's a few other questions here now that are queued up. Um, Let's see, someone asked, Isaac asked, is there a seal design that you think is your favorite? And I'm going to say maybe like in like maybe most inform quite informative, sort of uh, richly informative. Seal designs that are my favorite. Um, that's a tough one. I really like um, the, the seal here that I have, that I outlined the mark on, the one with the anchor and the birds is kind of my favorite because I haven't quite found what it means yet, but I feel like there's some sort of deep symbolism in it um, that I have yet to scratch the surface on. So I really like that. And I almost want to think that the two seagulls on top of the anchor represent the two partners in that merchant partnership. Um, so I, I, I just, I think that's really nice actually. If I if I were to get several more tattoos, that, that could be one of them. So. <laughs> Okay. But um, another one I really like um, is uh, the uh, seal for Nimes, which actually has a crocodile chained to a palm tree on it. Um, that one took a lot of digging to find out because there's this whole classical interpretation of it where the, the, uh, the crocodile is Cleopatra and she's been subdued by the Romans and chained to the palm tree, which all figures into Nimes' history because it was founded um, by uh, the legions of Octavius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, 
who had defeated Cleopatra and Antony at the Sea Battle of Actium. So you don't think Egyptology will come in handy when it does. Um, so those are my favorite. Great. So how many seals have been found uh, at Fort St. Joseph, roughly, is Katie is asking. Um, I can answer that. <laughs> I, I want to say it's maybe in the 40s. Um, you know, there's new ones found every year, so it's hard to keep count sometimes. <laughs> I yeah. can answer that for sure at the open house. If you come and find me, I will have the exact figure for you. <laughs> And I think you have a tabulation up through at least 2019 in, in that chat. Oh, yeah. Well. Oh, yeah. Great. So uh, let's see. Someone asked about the waterproof cloth. How do you spell that? Was that Cadiz, C-A-D-I-S? Is that right? Yes. yes. OK. Um, and it's, it's water repellent. So if you completely drench it, like if you go for a swim in the ocean, after a while, it will soak through. But it will also dry quickly, relatively quickly. So, but if you're out in the rain, you're not going to get wet. So wool in the rain is amazing. Um, doing reenacting stuff, I have a wool and broadcloth cape. Everybody else will be there in modern rain jackets, will look drenched and miserable, and I'm warm and cozy on the inside. So it does a really great job of sort of wicking away the moisture that might drop on you. So let's see, um, Alex asks, uh, I know it says, I know it would take a while for something to go from France to Fort St. Joseph. Would there be trade done with the Native Americans on the way to the fort, or would it just be at the fort that trade would occur? That's actually a really good question. Um, I know that some things in the canoe were actually supplies for the voyageur, um, and some things were bailed and were supposed to be shipped to a specific post. So I think we're look. I think your answer might vary depending on when in the history of the fur trade we're talking. But also, I have to say that it's it's probable that some of that equipment for the crew, if they had someone who was really insistent on trading and would trade for those items, they might trade with them or they might trade their personal effects as well. That is how the fur trade started. Um, if you look back at the uh, interaction between the Basque and the Native Americans uh, in the maritime areas of uh, Canada, they were trading sort of personal effects or materials that they were going to leave there anyway. So axes, um, any kind of tools that were desirable to Native Americans, textiles, um, any of that sort of stuff that was personal effects or supplies, they would trade to Native Americans, even though they weren't technically trade goods. Mm -hmm. And of course, at places like Fort St. Joseph and other uh, trading posts in the upper country, this was all uh, done through the, the congé system, right, the permitted. So th there are, you know, specific permits that allowed certain canoe canoe uh, canoes of goods to come to Fort St. Joseph so yes in so, theory you do get occasionally Cour de Bois but um I think Mackinac had much more of those perhaps uh but uh, who knows if they came in so you do have unlicensed traders that do do strike out but in general um you're supposed to yes be employed and have a contract with the merchant in montreal and if you're if your goods don't end up where they're going and you don't get your furs in return odds are you're not going to have a happy merchant when you arrive back at montreal which means you could not be on the next trip or you could just not get paid um and nobody wants to trek all the way to fort saint joseph in a canoe risking their lives to not get paid on the return for sure uh, so Matt asks, have there been seals found in shipwrecks that would help map out the direct trade paths from France to the New World? And I think some of those those trading routes are pretty well established, but how would you answer that also, Kat? Um I have one seal that was found um, that is a French seal. There, there are a lot of uh, British seals that turn up in canoe trip, canoe tip wrecks over in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, but in terms of uh, cloth seals from the French period found on shipwrecks, the only one I'm aware of currently is uh, one that was found on the wreck of the Machot, which was uh, sunk during the Battle of, the battle of uh, Restigouche, um, which was in the Seven Years' War. It was a naval conflict between the British and the French in, is that Bay de Chaleur? I think it's the Bay de Chaleur. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, so that that number nine triangle there is is the wreck of the mass show. Everything on there was really nicely preserved, actually. So they have um, uh, a toque 
that was preserved and some socks that preserved. So you have clothing items, silk stuff. Um, but uh, as far as I know, the, the, the seal wasn't actually attached to anything uh, when they found it. it had already degraded. So while you have that map up, Catherine, maybe you can just comment. So when, uh, when cloth makes its way to Quebec City and Montreal, then how would it still get, which is still you know, about 800 or 1,000 miles from Fort St. Joseph, how would it get then from Montreal to Fort St. Joseph? Um, in Montreal, you have uh, like a series of traders that specialize in the Western trades. So they're there to get rich in Montreal. They're like native Canadians, not native, native Canadians, but French people born in Canada that run this trade that have some experience in it. A lot of the fur traders started to crop up in even the 17th century when people settled on the land in Quebec City and Montreal area and they had natives wander onto their land to do trade. They started getting experience in trade and eventually these people sort of started businesses around it um, in sending trade westward, especially as, as tribes um, expected more people to show up to them instead of them coming to Montreal or Quebec City as it was in the early times. So um, these merchants in Montreal would, uh, they would gather goods, you know, they would have goods from merchants that were sent in that either they asked the merchants in France for, or they were sent. Um, there was some agreement in any case between Europe and North America, what they were going to get. And then from there, uh, they would employ people in the area to act as voyageurs. A lot of the time, the people that took a job as a voyageur were um, farmers that didn't have any claim to land. They weren't like the eldest son. There wasn't room for them to do anything productive on the farm. They were um, maybe urban people that were really bored, um, sort of people that didn't have anything else to do or any, else, any other way to get money would sign up to be a voyageur. So it's not something that people aspired to necessarily. Nobody like in New France grew up saying, I want to be a voyageur because it was dangerous. Um, there's many, many people that died um, bringing goods uh, to Michigan and to the upper country. So out of Montreal, uh, these signed teams of canoemen, so they all signed contracts. So if you go to Montreal and go to the archives, there's, this, there's the Montreal Merchants Records, and those have all of the these entries of people who sign on as voyageurs, right? And they're contracted. So they their their job is to literally go to that place, drop off the goods, get beavers, come back, and then they get paid on return. Unfortunately, a lot of them ended up using that money right away when they got back. So they would have to hire back on. So it's really, it's not a great job in terms of outcome and everything. Um, but that's that's essentially how it worked. You'd have these teams set out of people that were contracted to do it. It's kind of the really the, the semi-truck drivers of their age, um, except if you were driving semi-trucks over waterfalls the entire way there. And what about the specific route, Catherine? I mean, they're not coming through like, uh, you know, Lake Ontario and then Lake Erie. And yeah, the um, they would probably, that? yeah, um, where Ottawa is there is sort of the route they would take because um, you had a lot of incursions from uh, the Iroquois that were, they would kind of spike north and, and try to get at French traffic and try to disrupt um, tribes in that area because they became traditional enemies of the French in 1607 or 1609 actually, um, when um, Champlain started uh, firing at them. He essentially joined a skirmish with these, uh, with these Algonquins to go and beat up the Iroquois um, and he beat up Iroquois a little bit more than was expected because he loaded his wheel lock, uh, wheel lock pistol with like six arquebus. balls and wheel lock arquebus. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a gun expert in the room. Um, and he fired and, and killed a ton of the Iroquois where that's not necessarily the native style of warfare that was going on. So the Iroquois saw this as a huge offense. And so they became enemies of the French. So anything they could do to get back at the French, they would do. So you wanted to avoid those tribes, right? So you're gonna go sort of a more northerly route, um, kind of along where that border of uh, Quebec and Ontario is actually, you kind of go in that direction. You get to French River, mm -hmm. just following waterways essentially until you would sort of come out around Sault Ste. Marie um, or into Georgian Bay. Mm -hmm. You would then go to Mackinac and from there you could follow along that shoreline of Lake Michigan down to Fort St. Joseph. Um, you could also land in Detroit and take the Great Sauk Trail across there or use portages to get to Fort St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good.
So let's see, just uh, one or two more questions here. Um, actually, it looks like you got it covered. There are lots of uh, fantastic job, bravo, congratulations. You're looking well is what Suzanne Somerville had to say. Thank so, you. Um, <laughs> so great, um, thank you so much for that. And I'm sure everybody is, uh, is applauding even though you cannot hear them perhaps. <laughs> Uh, next week, uh, speaking of trade routes, uh, Michael McCafferty, who is a linguist who specializes in the Miami, Illinois language, is going to talk about uh, the portage at Fort St. Joseph on the St. Joseph River between uh, the St. Joseph River and uh, the Kankakee River. And he's going to provide some, some new information uh, about that portage that I think you'll find interesting. Um, so again, thank you all. And uh, Catherine, I'll let you have the, the last word, if you will, if you would like. Okay, well, thanks everyone for attending. Um, I'm glad to see that there's so many people interested in my research. And if you have any further questions, uh, I didn't put my email up here, but I'm sure um, if, you, if you Google me, uh, it'll show up someplace. So uh, my William and Mary address for sure. Um, but I hope that uh, you enjoy the rest of your evening and I wish you all happy researching. And we'll look forward to seeing you on August 6th or 7th at the open house. Thank you again. Absolutely. Okay. Yep, thank you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night.